Hello, it's the next part of robot dog development, and what you just saw then was the end of the last episode on Open Dog, which is an open source quadrupedal robot, where we're doing alternate stepping with diagonal legs and using an inertial measurement unit in the body to try and keep the centre of mass over the middle to stop it overbalancing. But as you saw, that wasn't sustainable forever, and that's mainly because it doesn't actually take steps to keep its centre of gravity in the middle, it's just skewing its legs, and at some point it'll skew them too much, and that upsets it and it can't balance anymore because basically its legs are stuck on one side and its body's on the other and it can't do anything to compensate. So last time I said the next stage was going to be taking actual steps to try and keep the centre of gravity in the middle and perhaps trying to walk along. That's proving to be a bit more difficult than I thought though because the robot is completely rigid, it's driven by ball screws and these brushless motors which can't be back driven at all so there's no compliance with the ground. And that means if it's not perfectly upright and staying perfectly upright, if there's any deviation or any tip then when a rigid foot hits the ground, it pushes it back the other way and that causes it to oscillate and then everything goes bad. Now when I built the feet, I've got these squashy sections so that we can put foot sensors in. So I could try and use that to sense how much pressure's on the ground and then make a virtual spring with the rigid actuators that allows it to be back driven and therefore the feet become more compliant and it'll be more forgiving. For those of you who remember the Robot X series, which was a human sized bipedal walking robot, I did something quite similar to this to get it working and fix similar issues. So in this bit of footage, you can see that basically it's compliant even though all those joints are driven in a very similar way with lead screws basically on linear actuators so they're rigid but I used the inertial measurement unit data it didn't even have foot sensing at this point to uh, make it compensate so if it leans sideways it bends one leg slightly and backwards and forwards it bends at the waist to absorb all of that load and make it dynamically stable. I also built a robot test leg in the past which had a motor with a bungee in between the motor and the joint and we can measure the joint position and the motor position and work out how much that bungee was stretching so we could work out how much force was being applied and that meant we could jump up and then make it comply with the ground. So that worked pretty well. During the robot arm series, I put all of those sorts of joints in every joint of the robot arm. So essentially series elastic actuators with a spring between the motor with an encoder and the joint. And again, we could measure that spring stretch and work out how much force we're applying or drive a certain amount of force. So we could move the arm around and have it stop when that spring stretches to a certain amount and we're applying a certain amount of force. So during that series, a lot of people shouted at the screen and said, why not just use current control? And the main reason is I didn't want to have to back drive those motors, which had quite high ratio gearboxes in. And for the same reasons, due to the ball screws, these joints really aren't back drivable to use any sort of current control. So you really do need foot sensing and then to simulate a spring with a rigid actuator. So before I go and mess around with Open Dog's feet and try and put some force sensors in and try and simulate a spring with those rigid actuators, which I believe is possible from the stuff I did on Robot X, I'm actually going to build a test leg in the name of robotics development. This is a robotics development YouTube channel, so let's do some robotics development. I bet Boston Dynamics have got loads of legs spare in their lab that they've done testing on. They just built one robot and it worked. So we're going to make one leg and we're going to try and use current control to make that leg compliant. And then we're going to smash it into the ground and we're going to see what happens. But to do that, we're going to need a fairly high powered brushless motor driven gearbox with a fairly low reduction ratio so that we can back drive it. So I've just designed something like that in the Performance Robot series, which you should check out. And there's a lot more of that coming soon. So this joint can be back driven. It's a two stage belt reduction with a 280 kV, 50 by 55 millimeter, about one and a half kilowatt brushless motor driven by an O-drive with an encoder. So we're gonna turn that upside down and turn it into a leg. So we've got one motor driving this mechanism with the two stage belt reduction, but you'll notice I've got this weird shaped crank on here. And that means we've got one motor which can move the leg up and down, but you'll also notice as it moves down, it also moves back in a slight arc owing to this weird crank shape. So that means the robot leg could actually jump along. If we snap that back, it should push the robot leg along. So that means it could move forward without any extra motors, which will be quite useful for testing.
So as with the humanoid robots, everything is made with aluminium plates, which are pretty parallel and those have got spacers in the middle that hold all the parts there. So we've got the motor mounted there with an encoder mount on the back, which we can put the encoder on. And we've got a plate with a clamp, which holds a piece of 20mm axle. It's actually studding, I'm sure some people are going to shout at the screen. Now that's done up nice and tight so it doesn't slip, and the joint itself has its own bearings that ride on it. So just trying to get all of those belts the right tension, they basically are an exact fit. So it's quite tricky to get the pulley on, but it can be done if you put it together in the right order. And that seems to run pretty well. We've got one more idler to put on, but that makes the main joint for the leg. So I've just fitted some bearings there, which act as an idler to hold that belt tight. And if we need to make it tighter, if it ever stretches, we just 3D print a barrel to make it slightly bigger that fits around a couple of bearings like a skateboard wheel. There's space for one of those at the back as well, if we need to tension the other belt. But for now, it seems pretty tight because I've made everything the right size for the belts. I made the foot for the leg out of Ninja Flex, which is flexible, so that means we can absorb some load and also hopefully get some grip. The main joints for the knee are made with 8mm studding bolted onto a 3D printed piece attached to that foot stick, and that means the bolts are nicely braced, and we've got bearings in the pieces on the outside, and everything's attached together with 2020 extrusion with T-nuts. To control the leg, we're using an O-Drive brushless motor driver with power plugged in and also the encoder that goes off to the encoder on the motor. And we've got a Teensy 3.6 with some serial lines there because I happen to have one and they're pretty quick. And I've just screwed the leg to this long piece of wood so we can bounce it on a pivot and we can see how much of an elastic spring effect we get. So I've powered my leg up with the O-Drive. We've got 40 amps of holding power and about 24 volts. And now we've got basically a spring that almost supports its weight. Now, I've already uh, made this piece a bit shorter by sliding the 2020 up, so uh, that gives it a bit of a better leverage angle and a bit more power. I might have to shorten these because we're right on the edge. As I go back on this pivot, we'll find we've got the spring effect because it's trying to hold it, but there's not quite enough current, and we could increase that. So we've got kind of a springy leg. If I go all the way back, at some point we get past the point of no return, and then it can't spring itself back again very easily. So just going to mess around with these leverage angles and we'll see what we get then. Right, I've made the leg slightly shorter now, so it's a bit stumpier and we've got some more power and I've made this test rig. So we've got it set up on this nice pivot, which means that we can test how springy it is. So let's power that up and see what we get. Right, the leg's powered up. So if we take the stick out, we should be able to see we've got this kind of spring here. That seems to work pretty well. It's also quite a bit quicker than Open Dog due to the gearing ratio, so... Unfortunately, there's not quite enough power to actually lift it at that speed with the load on and the leg holding itself up. But what we really want to test is compliance, so this is fine for the testing, but we're not going to be jumping anywhere. So although that works okay, and what we've got is a virtual spring, there's no actual spring in this leg, it's just the motor can't hold its position with that current limit. We can go up to 100 amps on the O-Drive peak, and that means that we could make it much more rigid, or we could turn down the current and make it much more springy. So a springy leg's quite useful, I guess, for absorbing load. But if you can imagine, if we had four of those legs and we tried to walk along, then basically that might be a bit of a nightmare because if we had actual springs or we had this virtual spring, then it's like walking on a trampoline. So it's going to be really hard to control. It'd probably be worse than if we had rigid legs that are predictable. So what are we going to do about that? So let's imagine it's a real spring and we've got a motor here which can turn. So we've got an actuator and over here, we've got the actual joints. And in between them, we're going to connect them with a bungee, which is our spring. So now if the joint moves and absorbs load, then the spring stretches and it springs all over the place like it does now. So in the robot arm, what we did to make it compliant was measured the difference between the motor position and the actual joint position. And we tried to keep the stretch on that spring constant. So as we push the joint to back drive it, and we exerted more force and more difference in the position, we had the motor catch it up. And the same in the other way, because we had two springs, in fact, on each side of the actuators. And that meant that we could drive the joint backwards, and we'd measure that difference, and if the difference was bigger, then we'd drive the motor, and we'd always try and keep that spring stretch constant. So essentially, that dampens it so it doesn't spring around. So all we need to do with the leg is exactly the same thing. So now if we stretch that spring, we actually have the motor catch up, 
and then there's no stretch on that spring to rebound so the joint doesn't spring all around and that's how we're going to do dampening. So that's all very well and good when we've got an actual spring we can stretch and we can measure the difference between one end and the other and work out what the force is and set the motor to compensate to remove that springiness. In our case though we don't have a spring, it's a rigid leg. The motor's just coupled directly to the leg with that gearbox with belts in. So how are we going to measure the virtual spring stretch so we can make the motor compensate? Well we could go and read the current drain from the motor, obviously we're holding it in a position and the more we try and force it away from that position in either direction we're going to get more current drawn and we can actually use the Arduino library that comes with the O-Drive to read back the current drain although it tends to be a bit noisy. We could put a pot on the actual joint and measure that position compared to where we've set the motor and that would tell us the difference, exactly the same as if we had the spring in the middle, but actually it's rigidly coupled to the motor, so we might as well just go and read that motor encoder position, which we can also do with the Arduino library, and that'll tell us where the motor actually is. So then we compare where we set the motor with its actual position, and that'll give us the difference in stretch in our virtual spring. We can then use that to make the motor catch up to compensate, and if we catch up completely, the leg would be completely compliant and it would stop wherever we put it, and if we set it for some other response, we can vary the amount of dampening and how much we absorb load as we hit the ground. So here's our springy, undampened response. So let's look at that graph. We can see the encoder position once we scale it in the view there. So we can see we get that spring and we get the rebound. And if we bounce it, we get lots of springiness in it and we can see that in the graph. So I've now implemented a PID controller, or at least the P part of it, because I'm only using the proportional part of the controller, and that takes a set point for where we set the leg to be, which is zero when it's straight. It then takes the input from the actual encoder position once we've stretched our virtual spring, and it gives us an error, and proportional means that if the error is small, it gives us a small answer, and if it's big, it gives us a big answer, and we can change the gain to scale that. So that means that we then take that error, and we add that to the original position for the leg. So that makes the leg catch up with the position we're pulling it to by a variable amount based on the gain of the controller. And that gives us a different dampening response. So this is a gain of one, which means it's completely dampened and it stays wherever I put it. Obviously gravity pulls it down again. If there were no gravity, it would stay there. But as it is, we can see we can push it up and it slowly goes down again. So it's not got the spring it had, but it's compliant with wherever I put it, uh, minus gravity. And if I drop it on the ground, it's just going to fall all the way down as gravity pushes it all the way down. So no spring at all, really. Obviously, if we tune the I and the D in the PID controller, we can make it react quicker so we could get a faster acceleration towards its target by increasing I and dampening that again with D. And that's what we used in balancing robots to make the wheels drive and catch itself. So at the moment, it's just taking the tiny value, which is the difference, and adding it on every cycle to the position. So that's why it sinks quite slowly. So this is now a gain of 0.5, so only half dampened. So we've still got quite a bit of spring there. Okay, this is 0.7. So quite a bit more dampened, and the return there is quite a lot slower. This is 0.8. So it returns quite a bit slower there, and it's much more dampened. So now it's time to smash the leg into the ground. So I've changed my pivot here. So the pivot's in a different place. We've got some counterweights on the end to help support this leg. And gravity obviously will have an effect on it. So I've got it so it falls down, but obviously we would be supported by the legs in the other diagonal corners, assuming we're doing the trot gait of smashing alternate legs diagonally into the ground. So we could stiffen those up, of course, as well and make them less compliant when they're pushed up. And the ones that are smashing into the ground turn that P value up so they're more compliant with the ground. It's really hard to say with only one leg, so for now I've just assumed that gravity will have an effect and it will push all the legs down. So I'm going to try smashing this into the ground with various gains on that pit to make the leg more compliant, and we'll see what happens. And the idea is that we try and keep a constant height on the robot, and we don't have the leg really ferociously pushing it all around and causing it to tip over like it does with Open Dog with its rigid legs. So first of all, we've got no dampening at all to see what happens undampened. So obviously we've still got quite a bit of spring in that leg, but let's just start it off. So there we can see when it hits the ground, it pushes the thing right up and it even kicks in the air. I can apply quite a bit of force to this, but it's still hitting my hand quite hard and it's pretty ferocious and uh, hard to control. So that would really be shaking the dog round if any of those legs hit the ground 
uh, heavier as it tipped over on one corner that would sort of push it back all over the place. And this is a dampening value of just 0.5 which was the lowest we ever tried. So there we can see that's pretty consistent. It's hitting the ground and it's complying with it. So that spring is dampened nicely. If I push it lower, pretty much the same thing, but it should return to its natural height. So that seems to be working pretty well. So going back to open dog, it looks like what we actually need to simulate is a dampened spring and not just a spring response, which should be marginally easier using foot pressure sensors perhaps so that if a foot does tip over onto one corner, it'll actually absorb the load of the ground and comply with the ground like this dampened spring effect rather than just pushing back as it does now and causing the whole thing to rock around crazy. I'd be interested to see if that's what I actually want though by building four of these legs and putting them on the corner of a frame with no other axis. Obviously we've got 12 motors three on each leg on open dog to move the legs in the other axis. If we just put four of these legs on a frame, made them compliant and then put an inertial measurement unit in so as it tips, the corner it tips towards becomes more compliant and see if we can just adjust that dynamically to see if we can make it perfectly stable. That'd be quite an interesting experiment to find out if that's what I actually want before I go and perhaps modify the feet here to put foot sensors in or something like that. So I'm considering whether that's a good next step before I go back to open dog. So you better subscribe to find out if I actually do it. I might have printed some of the parts already. And don't forget to check me out on Patreon. So you can support the channel through Patreon and YouTube channel membership. Just have a look at the links in the description below. Also have a t-shirt store where you can get various designs and those links are in the description as well. All right, that's all for now.